now to the Word of God, and we are taking our assignment this morning from Genesis, the 28th chapter. Genesis 28, and beginning at verse 10. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went toward Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of the place and put it under his head and lay it down in that place. He had a dream and behold, a ladder was set on earth with his top reaching to heaven and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth. You will spread out to the west and to go east and to the north and to the south. And in you and in your descendants shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land. For I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place, and I did not know it. He was afraid and said, How awesome is this place. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Surely the Lord is in this place. And I'd like to speak this morning from the subject of the power of his presence. The power of his presence. When we think about the presence of God, the psalmist talks about this. He says, I can never escape your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. And so while it is a biblical fact that God is everywhere, God cannot be confined to any one location. This is what he cautioned Israel when they went to build him a temple. He said, don't be confused. Don't confuse me with other gods who need and function in physical locations. He says, heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. You can't confine me. You can't nail me down to any one place. I am everywhere at all times. So in that respect, his presence refers to the idea that God is everywhere his omnipresence. But there is another important aspect to the presence of God, and that refers to the idea of there is a closeness, an intimacy with God that you do, may not necessarily have. Adam, in his creation, lived in that presence, 
He knew what that kind of communion with the Creator was about. And when he sinned, he was cast out of the garden. They heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. There they, for the first time, experienced a separation from God. They, because of their sin, caused them to hide themselves from that divine presence. Jonah also experienced this kind of separation where he, after being told to go to Nineveh, but Jonah rose up to flee Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa and found the ship which was going to Tarshish and paid the fare and went down into it to go to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Here's a man that actually paid to get out of the presence of the Lord. So his sin, his rebellion, caused him to separate himself from the presence. Moses, in the familiar scene at the burning bush, God spoke to him when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look. God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. Now, what made that ground holy? It was the presence of God. Take the presence of God away, and it's just dirt. There's nothing different about the place. The presence of God made it holy ground. The presence of God made the difference. Now Moses readily recognized the power of his presence. He realized that there was a different dimension. All his life he had heard about Yahweh. He talked about God. I dare say he even believed in him. But he never experienced the presence of God like he's doing now. And the presence of God changed this man's life. The presence of God made this man who he was. And the Lord spoke, and he said, Hear now my words. If there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to him in a vision. I speak to him in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. He is faithful in all my house. I speak with him face to face. Moses had obtained an intimacy with God that was unknown to the other prophets, that were unknown to other people. Moses fell in love with this intimacy. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face, just as a man speaks to his friends. And he, God, said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. He assured him that what you're experiencing now is not a fluke. It's not a one-time thing. It's not something you're going to have to reflect on. It's not something you're going to have to reminisce about. But my presence is something that I'm going to give to you. 
and will be with you in the days ahead. Then Moses said to him, if your presence does not go with us, don't lead us up from here. He fell in love with the presence of God. He came to depend on the presence of God. During Jesus' time, we know that the Roman Empire had conquered all of the known world. The Roman Empire invaded all of the known world, different nations. Most of their conquering involved warfare. Sometimes a nation would simply surrender rather than fight Rome and would say, fine, we will become a Roman colony. Others would resist and said, no, you will not take us without a fight. So Rome would respond with its military might and strength, and they would inevitably conquer that nation. Now, as they conquered the various nations, and while those nations now were under the Roman Empire, those nations still had their separate identities. They had their religions, they had their cultures, they had their lifestyles, they had different laws that they governed themselves by. So Rome's response, they were not interested in having a bunch of nations that were nothing like Rome. It was their intention to make those nations as close to Rome as they could possibly get. So the Roman Empire would send a man to that nation after the war was over. And that man was installed to that nation. He was dispatched to that conquered city or that conquered country. And he would take this man would take a fleet of people with him. This man, by the way, was called an apostle. You see, the word apostle was not a word invented by Jesus Christ. It wasn't invented by the church. It was used by Rome. And a Roman apostle was someone that was to go into the land and start restructuring the infrastructure, restructuring the educational system, restructuring the business structures. In other words, they were sent in there to affect the culture. They were sent in there to bring the presence of Rome to that nation. If everyone in Dighton, Massachusetts became born again, I wonder how much would change. What difference would it make? Of course it would make a world of difference to the individuals that they would come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ and receive eternal life. But it's a challenging thought for the church of God to think that if the brick church wasn't here, if the brick church were to close down, would Dighton know it? Would it matter? Would it make a difference? Would it even be noticed? The church of God was intended to impact its community. We see this now in business worlds. This is China. 
But now there's something about McDonald's that's familiar in China now. In other words, it impacted this culture relative to its restaurant. Here also is China. There's something about an American business when it's installed in a foreign land that it brings a difference. It makes a statement. This is in Iran. And so we see that the role of the apostle were to take his people and make a difference in the conquered lands. This is what Jesus had in mind when he says, when that day came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also named as apostles. And see, when he did that, they didn't look at each other and say, what's an apostle? They knew what an apostle was. And they knew what the call was. They knew what the expectation was. That I'm installing you as ambassadors. That I'm going to send you into the conquered lands. The spiritually conquered lands. And make a difference. This is what's behind when he says, I also say to you that you are Peter. Upon this rock, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Notice, by the way, he says, I give you the keys of the kingdom, not the keys to the kingdom. There is a difference. Jesus is the key to the kingdom. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. In other words, my church is to implement the kingdom of God in its community. My church is to have an impact. My church is intended to bring the presence of God everywhere it goes. Think of the Lord's Prayer. In this manner, therefore, pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Just like that McDonald's restaurant, there's something about the kingdom of God there's something about heaven. There's something about a community that is ruled under the lordship of Jesus Christ that he wants implemented on the earth. The church, therefore, is us representing God to the people. It's us demonstrating, displaying, showcasing the presence of God to all those who observe. The church is creating a God experience for people. This is what ministry is. Anytime you have a ministry, whether it be a church service, whether it be an area Bible study, whether it be a children's festival, what are we trying to do? We're trying to recreate and create a God experience that people will come in and see something different about what's happening here than what they're used to. Look at a familiar verse. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespass, trespass, do you know what I'm trying to say? made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised up with him and have seated us with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is a familiar verse to evangelicals, but when we think about it, we think about it as doctrine. 
But this verse is not merely doctrine, as important that is. It's a call to an experience. Being seated together with him in heavenly places is a call to experience. It's, it's not just a doctrine. It's not just a statement of our salvation positional stance with God. It's telling us that God wants to do something with us that you've never known before. He wants to do something in your life that people in your family won't understand. People on your job won't understand. There's a place in God that he wants to take us. The psalmist writes a psalm in 73, Psalm 73, and it's one of the sons of Asaph who begin to reflect on the circumstances of his life, at a time in his life. And look at the words that he says and see if we can't identify with his thoughts. Truly God is good to Israel, to those whose hearts are pure. But for me, I almost lost my footing. My feet were slipping, and I was almost gone. I'm going through picking out highlights, verses through this. I envied the proud when I saw them prosper despite their wickedness. They seemed to live such painless lives. Their bodies are so healthy and strong. They don't have troubles like other people. They're not plagued with problems like everyone else. Down to verse 7. I love this translation. These fat cats have everything their hearts could ever wish for. What does God know, they ask? Does the Most High even know what's happening? Did I keep my heart pure for nothing? Did I keep myself innocent for no reason? I get nothing but trouble all day long. Every morning brings me pain. So I try to understand why the wicked prosper, but what a difficult task it is. Then look at this. Then I went into your sanctuary. Oh God, and finally understood the destiny of the wicked. He had the same thoughts and problems, the same ideas, the same frustrations that you and I have all the time. What made the difference in this man's life? Then I went into the sanctuary. The presence of God gives clarity. The presence of God makes the difference. Outside of the presence of God, things look dark. Outside of the presence of God, anxiety will come. The cares of this world will come. Burdens will press you down. Outside of the presence of God, you're no different than anybody else on your job. But when you come into the presence of God, you start to see things in a way that other people don't see. Look at the angel Gabriel. The angel answered him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God. I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. There are certain blessings that can only be obtained in the presence of God. There are things that God has for you that you're never going to get outside of his presence. There are things that God has for you. There's revelation. 
that God has for you. There's blessings that God has for you, but you have to come into his presence in order to grab hold of them. Moses experienced the presence of God. When God spoke to him face to face, he had obtained a intimacy, a communion with God that was uncommon to other people. But he also imparted. But he says, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel, and you shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. In other words, he's saying that the face of God, that presence of God that Moses had. Moses says, this is not just for me alone, but this is for all of my people. That this is not something that was unique to Moses, but this is something that God desires to pass on to us. That there is a presence when his face shines on your life. When, he, when you walk into that presence, he takes you to a height in him that you don't experience anywhere else. You know, there are people that will look at me and wonder, why is it that he gets so excited when he's preaching? Why is it that he gets so worked up when he's up in the pulpit? And they think, like, is all that really necessary? But I come to tell you that when I walk, come into the presence of God, there's something that comes over me. And when the word of God gets in my heart, it's like a fire that's shut up in my bones. And it's a presence that I can come and it feels. And I can feel his pleasure. And I can feel his presence. And when I walk in that presence, I can know that God is with me in a special way. I can know that and feel him in a way that I didn't feel him before. When I come into his presence, it'll make me stand against temptations. It will cause all kinds of doubts to melt away. Sometimes when I get confused, sometimes when I get discouraged and I feel like giving up, I just lean back on the presence of God and know that he'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. I can feel him in my hands. I can feel him in my feet. I can feel him all over me. And in the presence of God, there's a joy unspeakable. In the presence of God, there's peace that passes all understanding. Hallelujah. 